What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. First and foremost, I wanted to say a huge thank you for all of the kind love and support and awesome words on last week's video. Um, I know that missing and murdered indigenous women are not covered very often just across the board and a lot of it kind of is a trickle down effect where the media doesn't report on it. So even true crime YouTubers can't really say anything on it because there's just not a lot of information out there. So I always get overly excited when I find a case I can actually bring to you guys and use it to educate and spread awareness. Um, and I had so many of you guys last week say that you wanted to do a little bit more digging and get a little better of an understanding when it comes to missing and murdered Indigenous women and just the Indigenous women in Canada and the history and all of, you know, the systemic racism and the Highway of Tears. And I actually found an audiobook that is perfect for you guys that we're asking in the video. It's not necessarily about Alberta's case, but Gary Kerr, the investigating officer that initially was on Alberta's case is a part of this audiobook and it's all of his experiences going into the RCMP and kind of what he learned along the way working with the indigenous population and the different issues between the RCMP and the indigenous population and the audiobook is called Highway of Tears and you can find that on Audible who is also today's sponsor. You guys already know I'm absolutely obsessed with Audible. Audible is the leading provider for spoken word entertainment and audiobooks with a vast array of categories everything from um, self-help, comedy, news, obviously true crime. You can listen anytime, anywhere from any device. I personally use my audiobooks when I'm at the gym, when the gyms are open. And also right now, while I've been working on my new workspace, while I've been building, I've just put on an audiobook. And since I'm out there for about 12 hours at a time getting work done, I can essentially finish an audiobook in a day. As I said, I've been listening to the audiobook Highway of Tears to get even a deeper understanding myself on the RCM and how they're handling situations with the Highway of Tears and the different victims and the theories and, um, you know, the indigenous communities and what they're dealing with along with their history and how that's causing a lot of struggles right now. When I stumbled across this after last week's video, I really wanted to make sure I made you guys aware of it. Right now, also, Audible is amazing, and they understand that we're all going through unprecedented times, and they want to ensure that everybody has access to audiobooks, no matter what situation they are in. With kids distance learning and adults at home with a little more free time and a lot of uncertainty going around, Audible's decided to give all existing members full access to the entire Audible original um, monthly selection. Typically, you would get two Audible originals free monthly, but now you can just download every Every single title have constant access to them. Um, listening to audiobooks can help a lot in times like this. Ease stress and anxiety. It's something you can even do with your family. And for those that are not members and can't really afford to spend that extra money on a membership right now, they are looking out for you guys as well. Audible has created something called stories.audible.com where you can stream hundreds of titles for free with no membership no strings attached, you don't have to pay a thing to listen to these stories. So you can still benefit from what Audible has to offer just in a little bit of a different way. If you wanna go ahead and give Audible a try, all you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash Danielle or text Danielle to 500, 500 to get one free audiobook and then of course the unlimited Audible originals and a 30 day free trial. Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring this video and now on to today case. Today we are going to be speaking about the horrific, and when I say horrific, that's honestly probably an understatement, murders of 16-year-old David Ray Cole and 17-year-old Timothy Paul Fowler, and this happened in 1982. So this case is almost 40 years old, and it remains unsolved. And there's not a lot of articles about this case online. There are a small handful of articles from around the time when the murders happened. And then there's another little cluster of articles from 2016 when the case was kind of reignited thanks to Tim's sister, Kim. Uh, but other than that, there's just not a lot of information. And uh, just to warn you, if you are the kind of person, which a lot of you are, that researches these cases after the fact, you're gonna find a lot of misinformation or not even necessarily misinformation, just like strangely worded information and conflicting information online about this and it's honestly sent the reddit threads and the web sleuth threads for a loop if you're someone that visits reddit threads and web sleuth threads for information on cases like this for this case in particular there's actually a, a lot of kind of 
conversation on those threads about things that his Tim's sisters already cleared up in a podcast. Um, so really the best thing within those threads right now is just the theories. There's not a lot of great information. Um, so I just kind of wanted to warn you on that. So David and Timothy lived in Deerfield, Michigan, and they were absolute best friends friends. Deerfield itself was a very small town uh, in 1982 with only around 800 residents at the time. And guess what? It hasn't changed much. There's still only about 800 residents. And the graduating class in 1982, I believe was around 20 students or so. I think it might have been like 22. So it genuinely was a town where everyone knew everyone. Everyone makes fun of that when I say it, when they're like, oh, well, everyone always knows everyone in these towns. But like this town, I mean... You could like throw a rock at your farthest neighbor. David was an only child and he was living on a farm off of P Highway and Blissfield. And Blissfield was a neighboring town, but he was like right across the line. So technically he lived in Deerfield. Um, he lived with his stepfather and his mom, Sandra. But Timothy, on the other hand, had a pretty large family. He was the second youngest of six children. I know that the rest of his older siblings had all moved out. So it was just him, his mom, and his dad, and then his 10-year-old sister living at the house. And they were only two miles down the road away from David. David and Timothy were just your average teenagers. Obviously, they did teenager-like things. They would occasionally skip school. Um, usually it was not for any terrible reason. Half the time they would convince Kim, Tim's 10-year-old little sister, to come with them. Um, and usually they were just kind of messing around. They were never ones to get into trouble. They were, you know, great kids, great students, uh, really respected their family. David and Tim got along so well, probably because they shared a pretty huge common interest, which was cars. They spent most of their time working on, I believe it was a Mercedes Benz at David's farmhouse. It was kind of like this old car, ratty car that they were trying to fix up, um, you know, get it running again, do all these cool things to it. And that's how they spent almost every second of their free time. And they even had plans to open up an auto body shop after they graduated from high school. So they were inseparable and everyone in the town knew that where there was one, you could almost always find the other. On Saturday, May 8th, 1982, David's mother, Sandra, and his stepfather decided to take a little road trip to Virginia to visit his stepfather's dad, who at the time was not doing very well. He was sick and they were a little bit worried about him and it was kind of a sore subject because Sandra had just lost her mom. So David had just buried his grandmother, I think like only a week or so prior to this. It was very fresh and the family was, you know, still trying to grieve that loss. And Sandra didn't want her husband to have to worry about being so far away from his dad, you know, maybe not seeing him one more time. So they kind of woke up and decided to go. Now, before leaving that Saturday morning, they gave David some money. They told him what his curfew was. They also told him to take care of the animals and how to do it and to make sure to turn the lights on in the morning for the animals. And that if he wanted to, they were giving him permission to stay at Tim's house while they were gone. And I think they were kind of hoping that's what would happen so that he wouldn't be by himself while at the farmhouse. I'm unsure of what David did for the rest of Saturday and that Saturday night, but I know that that Sunday morning, David and Tim were out at the farmhouse working on this car. And they worked on this car for the entire day and around the evening, they had plans to go back to Timothy's house. This day, it was Sunday, May the 9th, was Mother's Day. And obviously, David's mom was out of town, so Tim's family kind of took them under his wing and said, you can come celebrate Mother's Day with us. We're having a really calm get-together. We're just gonna have dinner and, you know, make a bonfire out back and relax. So that's exactly what they did. And it was exciting because all of Tim's older siblings were gonna be there, and it was like one big happy family event. The night was going well, and the plan was originally for David to stay at Tim's house that night. I don't know if he stayed alone at the farmhouse the night before, but this night he was for sure supposed to stay at Tim's. David and Tim all of a sudden had different plans. David all of a sudden wanted to go back home. He wanted, you know, to be there for the animals, to be able to feed them and check on them in the morning. So they tried to convince Tim's parents to let them both go back to the farmhouse and spend the night there. Now, this is a 16 and 17 year old and Tim's parents weren't so sure about sending them off to this farmhouse by themselves at night. 
Um, you know, there's just no telling what kind of trouble they could get into. They weren't bad kids again, but like you just never know. And, um, you know, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere and they wanted to be safe. They felt better if they were with them, but Tim and David were pretty persistent and eventually Tim's parents allowed them to go. It was around 10 p.m. at this point and Tim's older brother, Philip, packed both the boys in the car and headed down two miles away to David's house to drop the boys off. And from everything I've seen and heard, everything was fine when they were dropped off. Philip didn't notice anything strange, but something absolutely mortifying happened within the next hour. Philip got back to his parents' house, but within just like not even 30 minutes, so around 10.30, they began to notice this like glow in the sky. And Tim's mom was a little bit worried. She said that the glow seemed to be coming from the same direction as David's farmhouse, but everyone was like, calm down, it'll be okay. There's nothing going on, everything's fine. But they sat there, and the longer they sat there, the brighter this glow got. So Philip decided to ease everyone's mind, including his own. He was going to drive back to the farmhouse to make sure everything was okay. And the second that he got up to do this, fire trucks sped past the Fowler home. Philip chased after these fire trucks, and I can only imagine what that felt like because he followed them all the way to David's farmhouse that he had literally just dropped the boys off at earlier. And when he pulled up, the entire house was engulfed in flames. Now, I'm already trying not to cry. Um, this is so horrific and I thought I'd be okay, uh, but this is like such a triggering story for me because I lost my sister to a fire. Um, and so excuse me and my emotions right now. Um, but it was devastating. The entire house that he had just dropped these two healthy young boys at within around an hour was just engulfed in flames. And he had no clue if the boys were inside or if they weren't, if they were safe. And I will say that I've seen in different articles that the fire department didn't respond to the scene until 1245 in the morning, uh, which would indicate the fire started later. But this 1030 estimate is what Tim's sister Kim gave and she was present at the time. Honestly, either way, if the fire didn't start till around 12, that's still so fast after these boys had been dropped off. And like to think that something can go that wrong that quick. Everyone was in a panic. The first responders wouldn't allow Philip into the home. He told them that, you know, both these boys were inside. They wouldn't let him get to them. And he was trying, I think, to be as positive as possible and check everything else to see if they got out. He checked the barn to see if they were in there. He even went to his sister's house, which was nearby, to see if for some reason they escaped there or, you know, hadn't stayed at the house. But everywhere he went, he couldn't find the boys. And when he arrived back at the farmhouse, the firefighters broke through the news that the boys' bodies had been recovered. Both boys were in the downstairs bathroom of the house. Authorities and first responders initially weren't quite sure why they had gone into this bathroom. Maybe they went into the bathroom for refuge or, you know, had they been in there and then the fire started and then they couldn't get out. But as they started to take a closer look, things started to add up. And like as the sun came up and they were scoping things out, um, they could tell something else was happening here. The bathroom that the boys were found in was an addition to the farmhouse. So when the farmhouse was first built a long, long time ago, it was a very old house, there was absolutely no plumbing in the house, there was no bathroom, it was only an outhouse. And at some point in time, someone decided to add a bathroom to the first floor. And there wasn't really anywhere good to put it, and I guess they didn't want to lose space within the home. So they decided to just throw that sucker up right outside of the back door, on I'm assuming what used to be like a porch area. So the back door was now the entrance door to the bathroom. There were no windows and the bathroom also locked from the outside. And a lot of people on the web sleuths and Reddit threads were very confused about this, but I was able to find uh, Tim's sister state that it was because this was in fact the back door. The back door has, had never been changed. They just kept it as the bathroom door. It just swung open into the bathroom um, and you locked it from the outside. David 
was found inside of the bathtub. He clearly had tried to submerge himself in water to save his life and it did not work because the bathtub melted around him. And Tim was found behind the bathroom door and the way that authorities found him, it seemed as if he was trying to take the pins out of the door hinges to get the door off to escape. So... And both of them were still wearing the same clothes that they had been wearing earlier that night. So they hadn't gone to bed yet. This was, you know, this happened all while they were still awake and okay. Um, so it became pretty apparent that these boys had been locked inside of the bathroom. There was no way for them to lock themselves in. And then somebody set a fire. So what seemed to be an accident at first has now turned into an arson and a double homicide. Unfortunately, because the house was entirely burned to the ground, there was no physical evidence that authorities could gather. I'm talking, I think I only have one picture of it, I don't know if there's more, but you guys, house completely gone. But even if there had been something, you know, DNA and all that wasn't happening around that time and I don't know if that would have even helped anyways um, until later down the road, but any chance that they may have had disappeared. Only thing that authorities found was a gas can. Assumingly the gas can that started the fire, it was found inside the home and that was not where it normally was because it was actually a gas can that came from the Cole family's barn. So whoever lit this fire took the gas can out of their barn and then used it inside of the house. They were able to determine that whoever did this poured and splashed the gasoline all around the door of the bathroom. And this also has created a lot of questions online because there's conflicting articles saying that the fire was started in the kitchen. Um, but from the way Kim has described the layout of the house, the uh, bathroom was off of the kitchen. It was like an extension of the kitchen. So technically it's kind of the same place. I'm assuming that's why there's confusion. Um, from what I'm understanding, it was just right there in front of the door. Uh, and this led authorities to believe that these boys had been forced into the bathroom one way or another, locked in, and then the fire was set in front of the bathroom door to prevent their escape. According to Kem, the neighbor who called 911 also reported to authorities that he saw multiple young men standing outside of the house watching it burn as he was calling 911. Now, this has not been confirmed by authorities I've seen since then. Granted, there's not really a lot of articles anyways to confirm this, but this is what Kim remembers authorities saying to them directly after the murders. And then after these young men watched for a little while, they quickly left. So everyone in this town was in shock because this was a small town and things like this didn't happen. And I'll get even deeper into that in a little bit, but it was difficult because just like last week's video, it was a time where everything was recorded, pen and paper, that's it. So there's a lot of speculation on whether this case was even handled properly to begin with, whether information was taken properly, um, and between that and a total lack of media coverage, within weeks, this terrifying murder somehow went completely silent. Authorities seemed pretty certain from the start that this was an act done by other teenagers over a girl. You don't just pass through Deerfield just like to go through like you don't just casually take a ride through Deerfield to get anywhere it's literally in the middle of nowhere um you wouldn't pass through there there to get from one big city to another uh the closest large city i believe is like an hour and a half away and you definitely wouldn't just pass by david's house because it's kind of in this awkward position where it's not off a main road it technically is off of highway but it's not exactly a highway it's kind of hard to explain I'll have pictures for you to see um, but you wouldn't just pass by his house you'd have to like take turns and look for it and um, this really made authorities believe this was someone local Tim apparently had a girlfriend at the time and it came out fairly quickly that she had been cheating on him with a boy from a neighboring town called Petersburg now, Petersburg was just as small, I think it was actually a little bit larger than Deerfield, a population of around 1,000, but it wasn't far. To give you an example, I looked it up, and if you were in the middle of Petersburg, and you went from Petersburg all the way to Deerfield, and then from Deerfield down to David's house in Blissfield, that entire trip would only take you 13 minutes. So you could quite literally get 
from one side of a city all the way through the country to another city and then down into the country again in like absolute no time. According to witnesses that authorities interviewed, there was some history of issues between the boys, I think David maybe in particular, I'm pretty sure that's what I heard Kim say, um, and a few other teenagers from Petersburg, which in my opinion isn't anything out of the norm. The schools that they went to, it was like one school per town here. A lot of people just consider this to be your average teenage riff, nothing that would necessarily push anyone, especially young teenagers, to burn two other teenagers alive along with an entire farmhouse. According to Kim, Tim's girlfriend admitted to of multiple individuals plus authorities that after this all happened, she began to receive phone calls and these phone calls were threatening ones. And this person, and I don't think she disclosed who it was, she may have and they might not have released it. They said that if she spoke to authorities about what happened or told them anything that the same exact thing would happen to her. This kind of indicated that she either was involved in some way or she at least knew exactly who was and was being threatened into silence. Things from that were able to narrow things down to three different teenagers in Petersburg, and they were all brought in for questioning. And one of them was the guy that Tim's girlfriend was having this fling with. The boys ended up hiring a really great lawyer from Ohio and authorities, again, had absolutely no evidence. They just had what witnesses were saying. So everything pretty much came to a standstill. The boys walked away didn't have to answer any more questions, and everyone just kind of moved on from it. Because the boys both lived in different counties, and then the three teenagers also lived in Petersburg, another city, and I believe another county, state police became involved with the investigation, and I think a lot of people really hoped that with that added um, you know, you know, muscle there that they would actually have results. They would have more information, more things would be done, answers would come, but unfortunately that just didn't end up happening. Over the years, things continued to stay quiet. There was a whole lot of speculation, a whole lot of people in the town were scared because you guys, this wasn't this all like that's already something that's horrific but for this town this was something so insanely extreme that everyone couldn't understand or even fathom the idea that someone in their town could potentially do that to two other individuals and theories and rumors kind of started to spread some believed that this whole fight over a girl theory was definitely not possible and they believed instead that drugs were more than likely involved. And Kim, Tim's own sister, is one of the individuals that honestly believes this theory. Apparently, according to Kim, someone in Tim's family, right before all of this happened, had fronted someone drugs. And like, not just any drugs, they had fronted someone acid. And the dealer never ended up being paid the money. And from reading between the lines in her own posts that she put up on Web Sleuths, um, she kind of indicates that it was one of her other brothers that fronted this acid. And this brings up quite a few fears and quite a few different possibilities. This could go so many different directions. If one of Tim's brothers was having issues with a drug dealer, first of all, there's a common thing where these different drug dealers, they don't want to attack or hurt or kill the person that owes them money because they want their money. So oftentimes they will try to scare or threaten family members. Uh, cause usually that will get someone to act fairly quickly. And this became a huge possibility. What if they went after Tim knowing that it would bother his brother and hopefully they get their money. So maybe Tim was killed and David ended up just being roped into it because he was there because of this debt. There's also a possibility that it was mistaken identity. And this is something that Kim has said that maybe whoever was out to get her brother, that Tim maybe was the right guy and went after him. And unfortunately, again, mistaken identity. And while so many people believe that this is possible, others, even including myself, think maybe not so much. And I will kind of explain my logic behind why. If a drug dealer sent someone to take care of a debt and the intention was killing someone, which 
clearly it likely was, the people going to do that would likely be armed. Um, I don't believe that they would show up to a house. First of all, it wasn't even Tim's house. It was David's house. So how would they have gotten there or like thought to go there anyways? I don't think they'd show up there, force the boys into a bathroom, hope that they found a gas can in the barn and then light a fire that isn't even guaranteed to stay lit. That sort of situation is very risky, very sloppy, very unplanned. There's so many ways that this could go wrong. What if the fire was put out? What if it kind of sizzled out on its own? What if the boys managed to escape? If that were to happen, which could have easily happened, the attackers could be identified by both of the boys, which is probably even more likely because it's such a small town and everyone knew everyone. And I really don't think that some group of drug dealers would be willing to take that kind of risk. And again, that brings into question how on earth would this group of drug dealers that are basically putting a hit out on someone have known that Tim was at David's? I understand and a lot of people have explained this away saying that wherever Tim was, David was. Like it wasn't uncommon. But that particular night, the plans were decided on so last minute. David was originally all day planning on being at Tim's house that night. Tim's parents even thought that. His family thought that. Tim thought that. And then somewhere along the way last minute, his Tim's parents decided that they could go to David's house. And from that point on, things happened so quickly. And it's not like cell phones were involved. It's not like they could have texted a few friends real quick to tell them where they were at. I really just don't think very many people would have known about the boys' whereabouts. So either it was an incredibly lucky guess that they would be at David's house. Maybe there is a possibility that someone was watching Tim's home. But my only issue with that idea is that it was Mother's Day, a day where large groups of people, entire families gather together to celebrate. So again, I just don't see or believe that an organized group out to get payback for drug money is going to risk multiple people, eight family members, plus a ninth friend being witnesses when they go to act out their plan. I just don't, I just don't see that as being very plausible. This brings us back to the theory that this was all over a girl. And interestingly enough, majority of people don't believe this is true, but I can totally see the possibility here. A lot of people don't think that a murder like this could be carried out by teenagers, that teenagers are not this malicious, they're not this evil, they wouldn't be capable of this. But I, from the second I heard this story, wondered if maybe it was a situation where things went too far and killing the boys wasn't exactly the original plan. Like a situation where things got out of control and like way out of everyone's hands and a huge accident happened. Deerfield was a quiet town. If drug killings over a little bit of fronted money was common, which this theory would indicate that it is, you know, it was, I think, not even that much acid either, so it wasn't even a ton of money, then the statistic that I'm about to tell you, in my opinion, would be very different. Nobody had been killed in Deerfield in 50 years, 50 years. And then all of a sudden these boys are killed over fronted drug money and there's like some giant drug group that's kind of going around the town. I'm just having a really hard time accepting that. So the idea that some group of drug dealers went ballistic suddenly and killed two young individuals at like the perfect time when the parents weren't home, they are going after Tim and end up perfectly timed at David's house directly after Philip dropped them off. You know, I just, I think in my opinion, that's just too much that has to line up perfectly for that theory to make a lot of sense. I also question how close exactly the killer or killers could be based on knowledge of that bathroom being a perfect place to trap the boys, as well as the gas can being in the barn. Because 
maybe they just got lucky. Maybe it's someone that ambushed the boys and, you know, just so happened to realize that bathroom door was locked from the outside and got them in there. And then after that, just kind of assumed and hoped that there would be gas in the barn because of farm equipment. But again, to me, that just proves even further that this is a sloppy, unplanned situation of people hoping everything went their way, which to me, again, doesn't sound like drug dealers. <laughs> um, people that frequently go after people with the plan of killing them over a debt. That's why I think it's very possible this was a sloppy, um, you know, unplanned situation involving a bunch of teenagers that didn't have any idea what they were actually doing. And I'll kind of explain more why. If Tim's girlfriend was talking to another teenage boy from a rivaling town, I would not put it past said teenage boy and all of his friends to just show up. I'm sure they know where to go to try to cause problems and a fight or potentially pull some prank that they think is going to be funny and end up getting way out of hand. So many people in all the different threads on Reddit and Web Sleuths that I was reading said that there's no way teenage boys would go out of their way to do this. But honestly, I don't know if I've just seen some things in my high school experience or if this is across the board, but I know when I went to high school, I wouldn't put this past a lot of people, unfortunately. I know that our rivaling school came and set our entire football field on fire with like, like they had no idea if when they did that, it was gonna burn the entire school down. They didn't know if there was anyone there that they could have harmed, they didn't care. They just set the entire football field on fire. A lot of the times teenagers have no sense of consequence. And I think that this could be a recipe for disaster that created what happened. Young men fighting over a girl in particular, I think has more of a tendency to get out of hand as well, because it's almost like this attempt to prove like their manliness. It's like when you see animals out in like the wild, the men fight each other to mate with the female like they're willing to die <laughs> and like while that's kind of extreme for teenagers I still think there's this mentality at that age they want to prove themselves they want to prove themselves to women you know they're going through puberty there's a lot of hormones a lot of rage and things that they're dealing with and honestly when stuff like this happens in my personal experience I see absolutely no self-preservation at all and no thought process behind what some of these people do. So if Tim's girlfriend was being called with threats, that just screams that she knows someone that's involved and in my opinion puts this boy that she was speaking to behind Tim's back on the forefront. What if these boys decided to show up at Tim's house to cause problems? What if he wanted to get Tim out of the picture so that he could date this girl? Um, you know, there's so many different ways that this can go. Maybe they saw Tim and David there, but realized the whole family was there and they couldn't do anything, but then they saw David, Tim, and Philip leave. So they followed them and saw them get dropped off at David's house. Now, Philip, from what I know, just dropped them off and left. This put both the boys in a very vulnerable position. If anyone was watching them, either a drug dealer or, you know, this group of teenage boys, I think it's possible that they could have ambushed these boys and, you know, tried to intimidate them and scare them, locked them in a bathroom, and then, you know, maybe thought it'd be funny to like take it a step further to teach them a lesson and had no idea how far it was gonna actually go. But there are still so many other theories, you guys. So many other theories. I think a lot of people um, have also brought up the idea that this was a burglary gone wrong. And a lot of people disagree with that, saying there's no way a burglar would go to this extent, you know, they would likely just leave. And while I agree with that, I also, again, go back to the idea that this is a very small town. It's highly possible that a lot of different individuals knew that David's parents were out of town and what if they saw that the house was empty, saw the lights were off, assumed that David had gone with them and they broke into the house to steal something. There's no way to prove there was no break-in or anything like that or that anything was stolen or not because the entire house burned down. So I feel like there's just no way to know for sure. But what if this person showed up to the house, tried to rob the family, um, you know, maybe they had already been in the barn and saw what was in there and then they had gone into the house and then all of a sudden, David and Tim show up and scare the crap out of this person. Chances are this person was local and maybe Tim and David would have recognized him. If it was one person, maybe they had a gun on them. I just don't think it's very likely it was only one person because they probably would have used that gun to kill the boys instead of starting a fire to do that. So I think it's possible it maybe was more individuals that were robbing this home if again, this was the case so that they could get these boys into the bathroom 
bedroom without a struggle and then realized this could, you know, ruin everything. This could ruin our lives. These boys are going to tell everyone in the town about us and what we did and it's all going to be over. And so in a panic, they made a bad decision and set the house on fire so that they didn't have anything tarnishing their name. I think that's just as much of a possibility. It's just hard to say again because the, any evidence of that was lost as well with the fire. Some people have also speculated that the boys themselves maybe insisted on being without parental supervision that night because they wanted to go to David's house and use drugs. They wanted to do something that obviously parents would not agree with. Now, both boys' families have come forward saying that neither of them did drugs. Honestly, I feel like a lot of parents don't know the truth about if their teenagers do or not. Teenagers are very secretive individuals. And some people believe maybe they, you know, tried something out for the first time and they could have locked themselves in the bathroom and paranoia. Maybe they were just like panicking. Maybe there were hallucinations involved. And while I understand like where people are going with these theories, um, it's also pretty set in stone that the boys could not have lit the fire and then locked themselves in the bathroom according to the evidence that's been found. That the gasoline was splashed in front of the door. I mean, that means they splashed gasoline, lit this fire, and then just like leapt through the flames. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it's possible, but I just don't think it's very likely. And then to add to that, from what I'm saying, there was no way for them to lock the door and then shut it and be inside. Some people wonder if maybe the boys invited people over that night. I don't think they would have had a ton of time to do that. They would have had to get to the farmhouse and then use the home phone to call someone else and then those people would have had to come out. It wouldn't have taken long. Again, it was a very small town. If you can get between like three towns and 13 minutes, I'm sure you can get from one side of Deerfield to the other in like three, but I just don't know about that. I don't know. I feel like also if that was the case, more people would have ended up dying in this fire unless maybe the people they invited came with bad intentions. But again, I feel like Tim and David were smart individuals and they would have not invited someone over that they thought had any sort of issues with them. There are just so many different theories out there that it will make your head spin. Kim has pushed very hard to get authorities to reopen the case and that's exactly what happened in 2016. They had to take the handwritten notes and put them in the computer so that they could keep going over everything. I know that they have re-questioned everyone that was originally questioned and involved. From what they have said, most people have been cooperative. They didn't say all, they said most people were cooperative. Um, and they also re-interviewed Tim's girlfriend and she apparently forgot a handful of very important details until they like showed her the crime scene photos again and then all of a sudden she remembered everything. Some people question that and think she's just, again, being very secretive and not telling the whole truth. Authorities have also stated that as of right now, there are five suspects in the case. And that's kind of a huge deal for a case that's been sitting around for about 50 years. Apparently though, two of those individuals, two suspects have since passed away. One of them is in jail on unrelated charges, obviously. Um, and I'm not sure about the rest of them. Authorities have also come up with 15 different likely scenarios that they believe could have occurred that night. They have not directly come out and stated one way or another what they believed happened. I know that there is someone working on the case that is involved in drugs, so I know they're definitely looking down that um, pathway. And obviously they're still speaking to individuals who might have been the teenagers that there were issues with. So there's absolutely no telling. And it seems like everyone is so divided on what they believe happened. Let me know what you think down below. Honestly, I think everything that I've spoken about today seems plausible, but it's very easy to say that when there's not a lot of evidence in a case suggesting a very definite path. I think a confession or someone coming forward with information about what they heard or what they saw is going to end up being the only thing that solves this case. I'm honestly shocked that nobody has so far. When I heard that it was such a small town and all these people, you know, have to talk and talk and talk, I figured that someone would have come forward eventually and been like, I heard this, I saw this, um, and I that might have happened and maybe there's just no evidence for authorities to press any charges, but I kind of figured this would be solved. So when I got to the portion where it said this is still unsolved 40 years later, um, I was a little surprised. I am heartbroken for Tim's family. Um, I can't imagine 
how that felt finally allowing the boys to go over to David's house and within the hour seeing that fire light up the sky. And, and I also can't imagine thinking that a family member's involvement with drugs may have killed your son or your brother um, and another young innocent man. Um, I can't imagine Philip seeing that fire and all the things that went through his head and then being told by firefighters that he couldn't go and save them. I get it. I get it was for his safety, but um, I feel like at that point you become very, very selfless. Like you would run in that fire no matter what. Whether that's a rational thing to do or not, that's still a lot to deal with being told no when you feel like you could physically save someone. I feel terrible for David's family because they just lost a family member and they took this trip because they were worried about losing another and between all of that going on, they ended up losing a son and their entire home in the process. This is so sad. And I hope that both families get the answers that they deserve and it just makes me angry. Like this is one of those where I'm pissed to my core and I hope that whoever is responsible for this entire situation, the chaos and the pain and everything that they've put these families through, I hope that they have lost sleep every single night since this happened. Every single night. Whether it was an accident because some teenagers did something dumb or if someone showed up here, you know, over a drug debt, like these were kids, two kids with their whole lives ahead of them. And like to understand the background between both the families and like what was going on at the time and just, you know, how innocent these boys were like this, whoever did this is an absolute piece of crap. And I hope that even all these years later, it is eating away at them and that authorities eventually throw them in jail. That is all that I have for you guys today. I want to say a huge thank you for listening to both of these stories. This is heartbreaking and tragic and I have read and reread over this case so many times in like the past two years, I would say. And it because of like my own close personal connection to losing a sibling in a fire, um, it was very difficult to look through all of this, but I also feel like, oh, I hate it, but like I understand what that feels like for the family. Like clearly different circumstances for me, but it's, that's traumatic. And like imagining your loved one go through something like that is the worst in the entire world. So I wanted to make sure I told the story and did both these boys and their families justice because someone out there for sure knows something, you guys. Authorities have said that they believe there is someone in that town that knows exactly what happened and will not come forward and say a single thing. Again, thank you guys so much. Make sure you spread this as far as you can. If you were in Michigan, make sure you spread this as well because there was kind of this big hype for it in 2016 and I have not seen anything at all since then, so I have no idea really where it stands. There was a podcast put out in 2019, so I'm hoping this again does another little push and maybe gets the information out there. Um, let me know what you think down in the comments below out of all these 1 million theories that I told you guys. And also, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below so you can become a part of the Hallen fam. So hopefully we can bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.